G'day and welcome to Express Lane, a podcast for small business owners and franchisors to better navigate the trials and tribulations of growing a successful company. It isn't easy, but the rewards are definitely worth it. So Express Lane is bringing you industry leaders who share their wisdom and give you support in kicking your small business goals this year. I'm your host, James Buck, the country manager with InExpress for Australia and New Zealand. And this is our first podcast in the Express Lane podcast series. Today, I've got the CEO of Asia Pacific, uh, Marcel Lau, with InExpress. And we'll be discussing the pros and cons between traditional small business ownership and a franchising model and why many entrepreneurs decide to go down the path of franchising. So welcome, Marcel. Thank you, James. Before we dive into the detail, I just thought maybe you could provide us a little uh, more background to your experience and how you've arrived in your current role. Yeah, well, uh, certainly, James. Um, Well, I joined in Express as the uh, country manager for Australia and New Zealand and moved uh, into the CEO role for Asia Pacific two years ago. So my responsibilities are certainly across the Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, India, Hong Kong and South Korea businesses that we've got at InExpress. Um, I've got uh, multi-industry experience, uh, which I've found quite helpful in this role and a number of years in franchising across different organisations as well. So um, that's been quite important to provide me with some insights into different industries, how they operate, but more specifically, different types of businesses and the challenges that go with small business ownership as well, which is probably quite pertinent to uh, to today's uh, discussion. I think it absolutely is. I mean, obviously, we want to to talk about uh, how franchising can be a model that small businesses could use to grow, but also we look at it from an individual's perspective and, and, and how franchising may be beneficial for, uh, for individuals. How could a small business benefit from franchising? Well, one of the things that I've seen, um, not just at InExpress, but certainly in other, other businesses that I've been associated with, is the framework that franchising provides. And I think that small business ownership is very difficult at the best of times. And coming in and starting something from scratch and being on your own is quite daunting and can be quite overwhelming. And particularly in the in different economic climates, different industries, it can be quite difficult. I think franchising has been excellent in providing a framework for people and to feel like they're supported by a bigger team and they're not on their own. And I think that that is a primary benefit that franchising brings to uh, small business ownership. I guess if you if you um, think about a small business who wants to maybe grow mm-hmm. and they may be saying, well, how, how can I grow? Do I invest in my own sales team or perhaps I can invest in, um, in other resources to grow? Uh, franchising could possibly be an avenue they could go down to to help them grow yeah it does and and the good thing with franchising and particularly an established franchise model is that there are plenty of examples there from other franchisees who may have already done or tried a certain method whether it be from hiring a sales force or customer service Um, also the franchisor themselves will have certain best practices that they've learnt uh, over a period of time to guide the new franchisee in this instance. But you're absolutely right. You can take that uh, a slower approach in terms of investing in staff. Certainly in a model like ours at InExpress, yes, you can do that as you build up your business and then bring on the relevant sales or customer service staff to support your business. Um, And that's, again, something that uh, the franchising model or certainly different types of franchising models will afford you um, as a new franchisee. Yeah, that's right. I think uh, you've touched on a few really important points there, um, especially around the individual's perspective where, you know, joining an established franchise system with robust controls in place provides uh, a much lower risk uh, entry, I guess, into business ownership. Uh, And for small businesses, established small businesses or entrepreneurs who may want to to grow as well, um, there is a lot of experience out there that that they can draw upon to discuss how they may be able to introduce a franchising model to... um, to, to their business. We'll just address some of the concerns that people have around franchising. I mm. think we'll, you know, it's well publicised um, through the media, some higher profile cases. People have concerns about franchising, whatever, whatever they may be. H- how do you sort of address that? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I liaise with a number of franchise systems and have over, an, uh, over a number of years now. So there are discussions that we have um, around certainly best practices in franchising and and what some of those concerns are. And one of the things I think I want to say at the outset as certainly not just as somebody who is a franchising advocate as I am, um, is that 99% plus of 
franchise systems and the people within the franchise systems do the right thing as is the case in sometimes in media you tend to hear just the bad news stories and not the hundreds and thousands of uh, of good news stories that there are and i think for any person that's considering franchising it's important that there is transparency on the franchisor's part now i know at inexpress certainly that we've got quite a comprehensive eight-step model um, which involves providing franchisees with all the information and more that they need to make a sound decision in which whether they should go into that um, into our system and I know that other franchisors do that as well but first and foremost anybody going into just as if you as if you're starting your own small business or you're going into a franchise model you have to do your homework you have to get all the information necessary and if you do that and seek the right um, independent advice as well prior to signing a contract and prior to actually going forward um, with that business, that's going to mean that um, you, you're not going to experience those problems. And I think that that first and foremost at the outset is really, really important. And then to continue that approach even after you've gone into a franchise system as well to make sure that you're doing things the right way um, and following the processes that are there and in place. And I think that that in itself will account for certainly 90% of the problems that, that sometimes do arise in, uh, in franchising. What, what sort of documentation should uh, somebody expect from a potential franchisor when they are considering their, uh, their network? Look, certainly there should be comprehensive information about the company itself, that goes without saying, but there should be always a disclosure document that goes with that. Um, having that disclosure document is exactly as the name suggests, a disclosure document. So it's full disclosure from the franchise or providing information on their franchise system and a lot of intricate details that go behind that that help um, the prospective franchisee with, uh, with their decision. So certainly the disclosure document, but there's many other supporting documents that, that go with that. And in the latter stages, James, they have to also have um, a copy of the franchise agreement. So um, a, a copy or a template of what that franchise agreement is. So there are no surprises in that and they can go seek independent legal advice as well um, to go through that, again, to avoid any surprises. And that means that there is full transparency on the franchisor's part and it allows the prospective franchisee to make a more informed decision. So those those things with a disclosure document, a franchise agreement template, and information on the franchisor, on their model, and what their business is about is uh, is the minimum. It sounds like there's a lot involved in that, and there's obviously um, um, a heavy, I'd say, re compliance requirement as well, um, if I look uh, externally and, and, and at some of the news and yeah. media that's available uh, around franchising and, and relevant changes. How important is support from a franchisor's perspective to its franchisees? It's critical, and, and the reason that people go into a franchise system, um, as I alluded to earlier, is because of the framework that a good franchise system and an established franchise system will provide. With that underpinning, all of that is support. So they have to have staff there that can support the franchisees. Similar to our franchise system, uh, there, there's business coaching, there's customer service or franchise support staff. It might be finance and collections and other areas like that. There might be marketing support. So all of those elements that the franchisor provides makes it easier for the franchisee to go and worry about other things, so to speak, and concentrate on growing their business. So that's the sort of thing that, that franchisors need to provide, and it certainly should be disclosed uh, up front in that discovery process prior to signing um, a franchise agreement. So really a franchisee um, typically is responsible for sales and customer service and then other back-end functions are really sort of provided by a franchisor. Yeah, and I think it differs in different franchise systems. In Express being a B2B model and, and certainly focused on uh, how we operate is we provide quite a high level of support in those areas to allow our franchisees to really focus on the new sales of business customers and the relationship management and account management and customer service of those particular customers. Um, we do that. Other franchise systems are slightly different in what they provide and what level of support, but that needs to be made 
clear and and quite upfront with what level of support they are providing. But as a minimum, uh, all franchise systems will provide a good level of initial training and ongoing training, uh, and then various varying levels of support services to equip the franchisee to be successful. In the InExpress model, and we will just go back into that for a second, it's a model that doesn't have um, sort of primary geographies or mm-hmm. franchisees aren't locked into territories, so to speak. We'll talk about some of the advantages of that versus the disadvantages. Yeah, again, we're, we're lucky at InExpress being a, a B2B model in that our customers, our franchisees are small business owners and our customers are SMEs as well. So you've effectively got SMEs selling to SMEs. So there's a there's a really nice synergy there. And with our model being non-geographic means that the customer base can be anywhere. And the nature of our business with freight services and freight consulting and being bookings being made through an online proprietary software platform means that those customers can be anywhere. So the biggest advantage for us is that you, a franchisee at InExpress can be speaking to a particular business in, say, Sydney, for example, provides excellent service to them, and then that Sydney office goes and recommends that franchisee to their Perth office and to their Adelaide office, and that franchisee is not restricted in being able to go and service those other offices as well. So it's certainly the nature of our business allows for that, and we find that that's um, very helpful in being non-geographic. It doesn't quite work that way for other franchise systems, in particularly retail in the B2C space. They have to be, and I've been in franchise systems that are certainly have to be more uh, territory-based, and that works for them in those particular models. Uh, But for us, that's a huge advantage from a non-geographic base for our franchisees to grow their customers and grow their customer base. Well, Marcel, you've been quite involved in the FCA for quite some time now. Can you talk us through your involvement with them and and what programs you're sort of um, involved with still? Yeah, certainly. Look, the Franchise Council of Australia have been uh, have been very good for franchising, and I've been fortunate to be involved in in I suppose uh, different capacities um, over over the years. Um, that includes being a panelist and speaker on at, at different events, their national convention, which is an excellent forum for for all franchisors and and franchisees as well uh, to attend with the different areas of uh, of franchising. But I think one of the biggest benefits of being involved uh, for our business in general, but for me personally also, has been that peer-to-peer engagement with other franchise systems, um, sharing our learnings together, looking at ways that we can improve in our businesses, um, sharing ideas, uh, looking at problems which you know uh, that, that may have arisen in the past as well so that we can collectively improve and really bring franchising up in general. That's probably one of the biggest benefits, James, I've seen over the, at least certainly over the last five years. Mm. And I think that level of co- collaboration is uh, is very, very important. Also through the Franchise Council, um, they've got, as they do overseas in other associations like the US as well, um, have their CFE program. I've been on and which I've done um, as a certified franchise executive. And we've got other people in our business here that have, uh, have gone through that program as well. Uh, and that's quite important important to understand all the different aspects of franchising and how to be uh, an effective and responsible uh, franchisor as well. So there's there's been multiple, multiple benefits, but I think that peer-to-peer engagement has been uh, very, very important and shows the benefit of being associated with the FCA. Yeah, look, I can speak from personal experience there too, um, not having a franchise background, but coming into um, InExpress over the last two years and experiencing the support that the, the um, FCA does offer all franchisors who are members, uh, such as InExpress, uh, to ensure their staff are developed, uh, are certified and kept up to speed with um, the various changing requirements um, of the industry overall. I guess if we talk at an industry level then, um, how has the pandemic impacted franchising over the last 12 months or so, uh, as opposed to perhaps um, prior to that? Well, it's been extraordinary. It's What happened is unprecedented, and I think that there was no rule book for anybody in business, in franchising in, in general. One of the things that you will see variations there in different franchise systems and certainly we're a b2b model so um you know we we had a a different level of impact to say other industries in say retail and 
B2C environments. Communication came to the forefront. Um, and I think that um, different franchise systems communicated in different ways. Um, they had to think quite quickly. And one thing that was um, very, very important for all franchise systems was to communicate with their franchisees. It was a very, very tough environment. It was tough because of certainly travel restrictions and a lot of people not being able to do traditional face-to-face -face type of engagement. Um, that presented challenges and meant that other things like operating um, over the phone people staying in touch through different means, whether it be through video uh, conferencing and other things like that, it just changed the way that people had to engage and the way people had to sometimes actually do business as well. And some people have suffered sadly quite a lot uh, in the franchising industry and in other industries as well, and others have fared particularly well. So it, it really has been a mixed bag, but it's been something that most people would not have experienced in uh, in their life or in their working life. So just a link in there then to Inexpress specifically, you touched on the fact that some networks of uh, franchise ors have uh, performed really well and others have, uh, like a lot of businesses out there, non-franchising as well, experienced some challenges which are still ongoing. How's Inexpress performed specifically and how's it positioned for, for the future? Obviously Australia in, in our Inexpress business performed um, very well and had had over 30% growth and I think that uh, in 2020, that's also testament probably to the team that we've got here, but the franchisees as well. It's a massive team effort and everybody's done very well. Uh, people had to change the way they do business, as I said earlier, and um, that included the franchisees in how they liaised with their customers, how they got new customers and looked after their existing customers. What's particularly pleasing for, for us as a business is that we had that growth across Asia Pacific and globally as well. We're in 14 countries and in this region in Asia Pacific, we're in six countries, which includes obviously Australia and, and New Zealand as well. And we saw that growth um, across all of those businesses, which was pleasing to see because it's testament to our franchise model and the resiliency of our model and some of the flexibility that we've got within that model um, for people in terms of how they operate. So that was quite good. We have some excellent insights because our customers are business customers, James, so we can also see what's happening in those individual industries. We've got those, we're very fortunate to have insights into what's happening across different industries to see where freight is moving, what changes were happening, what was coming you know, inbound into Australia, what was going out, and we've also got that across the 14 countries uh, globally as well. So it's been fascinating to see some of those changes where some of the increases have happened, such as um, domestic freight over some of the challenges with some of the international freight uh, as well. So we fared very well. I feel very fortunate that we're in this franchise system and feel very lucky that we've got the team that we've got. That includes you as well, James, by the way. Which is nice to know. Which is very nice to know. Um, but yeah, I, I think that we've been both lucky, but at the same time, um, I think we've been flexible and nimble enough to... Uh, to create that luck for ourselves. I think you touched on a few good points there. From an inexpress perspective, if I put my hat on, uh, we do have that view across small businesses uh, who are our customers ultimately, and, and they number in the thousands. They are also in different sectors and, and different uh, parts of the community as well. And so the point of this podcast really is to, is to use that knowledge and to impart that on other uh, small businesses who, who may be able to benefit from some of, some of our knowledge. All right, Marcel, thank you very much for your time. I know you're very busy. We very much appreciate it, and we look forward to catching up with you in future podcasts as we continue through the year. It's my pleasure, James. I'm James Buck. Thank you for listening to Express Lane. Don't miss any of our small business insights by subscribing to the Express Lane podcast on your favourite podcast platform or connect with InExpress Australia and New Zealand on Facebook and LinkedIn. And for anyone keen to join our global InExpress franchise network or to learn more about our services, visit our website, inexpress.com. Stay safe and catch you next time.